thank you for coming this morning. Thank you for being in a session that's going to be recorded. I will not embarrass anyone other than myself, so you can relax. Um, I'm going to break all the rules of good presenting and mostly talk to you this morning because it's a short session. But uh, I became interested in using images in my own classroom and then have continued to work on this with uh, Donna Clementi. And so what we want to do is talk really about why images are powerful and how they support teaching in the target language. If you think about it and you've read it, how many of you are parents? Then you know that we start our children off with picture books. We would never think to avoid images. And there's actually research that shows now if you don't have exposure to picture books as a child, that you are thwarted in your ability to visualize words for the rest of your life. So it's really, really important that we develop this kind of visual literacy. And if you look at my charming grandson, who's now six, but when he was two, and you think about this picture, what makes this book attractive to him? He can't read words. He's being drawn in by the images. And so when we talk about hooking our learners and making them interested in our content, and they even have very few words, only images can draw them into the content. We also know from research what visuals can do for us. They really help us with retention. Those of us that are older, we may have grown up as auditory learners, but we do not have many auditory learners in front of us any longer. We have visual learners, and they are used to quality visuals at the click of a button. So we really want to use these images. They help to trigger emotions. Images have a complexity to them that allows them to stick in our brain. We all have our favorite works of art for different reasons as a part of that. So it's, what I'm sharing with you, I'm not going to go over the theory all that much, but there is plenty of research out there for those of you who like to go the research shy, side of why we're doing this. Visual literacy is this ability to read a message from an image. And now we also have to teach them to discern whether the image is true or false. Because with Photoshop, we have to be careful and not assume that every image we see is a real image any longer. Your picture could be photoshopped into any setting now, and you would have to explain that you actually were not there. And when we think about what is a visual, it's anything that has image. So it could be a text, it could be a photo, it can be a website. It's anything that gives you an image, and it's easy to bring authentic materials in through that image. More importantly, Moraine said that it allows you to think like you are part of that culture, to interpret the image the way a culture interprets the image. So let me give you a chance to see what that feels like. Let's look at what we're going to be doing with images. So images give us this opportunity to do two things. If you look at that tell domain, we're gonna access culture through the image. This session doesn't focus too much on producing language. It focuses on that receptive skill, that accessing of language, the input of language, using images to communicate meaning without very many words necessarily, and also then using images to springboard to communication. But when we talk about comprehensible input, we can get a lot of that off of the image. Where were those parents? You've got a young child on your lap. I said this yesterday, you're reading a picture book, and there are too many words on the page. What happens? I think this is universal across cultures. Anybody remember what that child does when there's too many words on the page? They want to turn the page. You, being the well-intentioned parent with a teacher mindset, 
you want to finish reading the words on the page. All parents attempt to finish reading the words on the page. So you put your hand down on the page. If you keep your hand there and continue to read, what's going to happen? They're going to tear it because they're ready to move on. So as a parent, what do we learn to do? Read faster. That's the first thing we try. Read it faster. The second thing we do as a parent is we start paraphrasing. We tell the story of the pictures more quickly. When we read that book for the 30th time, we might be reading all the words on the page. So it's very much what we're going back to in first language acquisition and thinking about it. So take a look at this image taken in a French cafe and just turn to your partner very quickly and tell them from your perspective what does this image suggest? You have 30 seconds. Turn and talk. If you thought about this as a springboard to the culture, visual literacy means that you can interpret it the way a French person interprets it. So you can really go into the image. You have to see it the way that culture sees it. So from an American perspective, we might be dismayed that there is a dog seated and on a chair that I might sit on later. I don't know a dog's butt was on that chair when I come back in. Think about it. That might really upset someone from another culture. But to the French, it is that the dog is a valued member of the family. And of course you take them into restaurants with you. You would not leave man's best friend at home so you bring them in. So it's, it's judging an image the way the culture judges the image and not from your perspective. And that's what makes them really fascinating, to really look at images. Images have the ability to provoke emotion. That's one of the things they're going to do. We're going to look at all of these points, but first to provoke emotion. All of you reacted to that dog picture from a certain lens. If you liked dogs, you had one perspective. If you didn't like dogs, you have another perspective. It was a real image. How many of you remember the days of textbooks with clip art? They don't work. They're boring. So let's take a look at that. Images have to give us a way to really begin to develop these 21st century skills. Otherwise, you get a high school student for the first time, and you're trying to teach them something along the lines of colors. You cannot teach the colors of the rainbow if they're 15 years old. So you've got to bring in these 21st century skills in a way that provokes their emotion. Because without provoking emotion, you're not going to cause the learning to stick. Real pictures provoke emotion. You look at an image like this. I'll answer this question later with a different slide. But you start to wonder right away, what's going on? What are they looking at? You could even ask students to predict. What are they looking at? What are they doing? Because you have the answer coming up in a couple of days. You're doing the soap opera version of teaching when you do that. Now, I just want you to think about this, because we don't have time to really process all of these. This is a transparency, so you know how long I've been in the classroom. I know many of you don't know what those were. Just count your blessings. But publishers always prepared transparencies in the past just as they put images in now into image stacks. So is this a picture that you really want to talk about? Think about that. If I said turn and talk, yeah, you'll do it because you're compliant and you want your A. But it's not because you're inherently interested in this picture. That would be my suspicion. What about this one? Is it a little bit more interesting? Why? Emotion. We have all been in a situation where we can identify, hopefully, with the little guy and not the big guy. <laughs> OK, but maybe occasionally, if you're a parent, you've been in the big guy position, too. What about putting them together? It, makes, it forces you to think, when I select an image for classroom purposes, does it connect to me emotionally? If it's a blasé picture, if it's an image that appears in every textbook known to man, 
no matter what the language is, it's probably not going to be as effective as another choice. So what about this one? It has emotion, but it went one step further than the bully. It's real. Is anybody wondering what the heck is going on here? You can hardly avoid wondering what's going on, which means that because it's an authentic text, because I have the article to explain it, written by native speakers for native speakers, finding this image allows me to provide the visual support that novices need. It brings in real world culture. And for those of us that grew up teaching on a grammar paradigm, it avoids it. Just like those picture books you read to your children use different tenses, so too do real artifacts from the culture. I always joke, my son was passionate about dinosaurs. Imagine my dilemma as a parent if I had prescribed to the notion that he could only deal with the present tense when he was seven years old. I would not have been able to read my childhood book on dinosaurs. I would have had to wait till he mastered another tense. We just have to remember that Real is what we want to give our students with that message that we can help them to understand, but most importantly, with a message they want to understand. If you try to get a four-year-old child to sit on your lap and read a book that they have not self-selected, you're not going to be as successful as when they self-select. Has anybody ever tried to dissuade a child from reading a book for the 30th time? You just don't want to read that book on spiders again, but you cannot convince them to pick a different book. It has to be the message and the meaning that they really want to have. It is our only hope of stimulating critical thinking, even if we can't get them to talk about it much yet, in those novice classes. So for those of you that are working with high school and university, even middle school, the images up the level of thinking in the brain, even if the words aren't there yet to capture it. And so I always, always, always use Helena Curtains. How many of you have seen this image before? Because it's the clearest image to express this point. I don't know how many of you speak Spanish. I'm going to caption it in a minute. I want you to really think about that picture. You're reacting to it with different emotions, different feelings. Maybe you forgot what it's called. But when I put up what is basic novice level language and caption it with, I am not a coat, I am teaching coat in a context that is cognitively engaging to an older learner. I actually walked through an airport recently where it was all kinds of animals. It was like, I am not medicine. I am not an aphrodisiac. I am not a purse. And it was all these different animals being used for all these different things. And when you think about it, the clothing chapter typically is a boring one because the clothing, if it's poorly designed, what is she wearing? I can see what she's wearing. What color is her jacket? I'm trying to teach the word jacket. I know what color a jacket is unless I'm colorblind. So it's finding ways to teach this novice vocabulary in age-appropriate ways. Anyone in here speak French? Because if you do, I just struck terror into your heart. Because it says, soon, the end of chocolate, and goes on to describe how the cocoa bean is disappearing. Now, I don't want to panic anyone. But there's another bean that grows in this same climate zone. Anybody know what bean that is? Coffee. Think about it. We are predicting the end of chocolate by 2030. They're starting to try to figure out how to manufacture um, simulated chocolate because of this. This is serious. When we show an image, we might not have much we can do with it. But the one thing we can always do, critical thinking, intermediate low, we make the students ask the questions. 
So turn to your partner, look at that image, and think of one question a novice level learner might be able to ask. Quick, turn, question. Okay, call out a couple. Where are they going? What are they doing? How many children? How many girls? How many boys? Who can help them? What are they looking for? Where do they live? How old are they? What are they wearing? Anybody know the answer? I had a year and a half in Puerto Rico and snipped this out of a newspaper. They're getting grass for the horses for Three Kings Day. So use your images. You go abroad. You take these wonderful pictures that have stories to them. You can use your own pictures. Those are the best. Or you can find other evidence of text. The study, because I know there's some people in the room that really like the theory, go to Harvard's work, go to Project Zero, look at what they're saying about visual literacy and the strategies. There's a whole science around this. And so if you want to go there, the, you'll have the PowerPoints you can go to the visual thinking. But basically what they're saying is these are the things we can do. How many of you are being challenged to use textual evidence by an administrator? If that's a concept you've heard, it's hard to get textual evidence out of a text when you're a brand new Chinese learner. They can't read that. But there's textual evidence in images. And so when you look at an image, what they suggest is there's a strategy. So we always think about how are we going to stay in the target language. One way is to use the same questions every time. And actually, it's a research set of questions. So the three questions are, what is going on in this picture? Pictures tell stories. When you think about the number of books that have been written off of a work of art, they delve into the work of art, and then Dan Brown goes and creates a whole novel around it, right, and gets rich. We should take that up. What do you see that makes you say that? Textual evidence. Why did you say what you said? You saw something in the picture that gave you proof that it was summer. What was it? It could be a really simple sentence. What more can we find? And this last one, they did an analysis of teachers. We say, what else can you find? And what the research said is by asking what else, we suggest we don't have the right answer yet. What more says, anything's OK, anything's OK. Whatever you say, I'm happy, as long as you can justify it. So I throw up a work of art. This has a story. It has seasons. It has weather. It has color. You can see all these things you can do. And I start to ask you to analyze the picture. But the picture itself is very complex. So you've looked at it for a minute. Now I want to show you a technique for using images to their maximum. So you don't reveal the whole. You reveal pieces, the old guessing games that we used to do. So you try to start to make a game of it. And you look at that lower quadrant and you analyze it. Well, the only thing you're going to get out of the lower quadrant maybe is it's summer and there's flowers. And what color are they? There's not much in the lower quadrant. And then you show another quadrant. And now you know it's a pretty day, and it may be spring or summer, and it's not raining, and it's sunny, and whatever. I see clouds. And you're not seeing much else, except did anybody else see something now that's small in it? A house, which when I showed the whole picture might not have stood out. So it's so small back there. So you look at another quadrant, and you see this mom and this daughter walking. And you look at another quadrant, and you see another mom and daughter walking. But when you saw the whole image, I should have put it in for you again. I'm going to go back real fast. When I saw that whole image and said, tell me what you see, odds are some of you didn't even see the house. Some of you saw the foreground with these two people, but you didn't notice these two people up here. So it shows you how segmenting and putting in quadrants can cause you to actually get in. The only reason I'm putting up the sample can do or learning target, however finite it is, granular it is in your program, is when you're thinking about describing people and places, they can be works of art. They can be real images. So we have low level ideas for our novice, appropriately so. It doesn't mean that what we anchor it with cannot be cognitively and challenging, engaging emotions of our learner. Images help to put it in a cultural context, a little bit like the dog photo that we talked about. If I ask you to visualize this, it's raining, let's go swimming. Every one of you has now a mindset 
of what that swimming pool that day looks like, correct? And it's probably, depending on how long you've lived in the United States, somewhat similar. All the money factors in, because we got some pretty nice indoor water parks if you have the money. So you might have envisioned that YMCA with the slide or the water park and the da 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 This is how I'm going to wear my kids out on a nasty day, et cetera, et cetera. But that is a stereotypical reaction from your cultural viewpoint. This book called A Place Far Away, Let's Go Swimming, It's Raining. It has a cultural connotation. My Puerto Rico story that I sometimes love to tell is let's go to the beach for the day. It's my 35th wedding anniversary. That sounds good, right? Puerto Rico, Caribbean, let's go to the beach for the day. How many of you are picturing blue water and white sand? I don't think, by boat, by boat. I don't think any of you pictured a mangrove island where you stood waist deep in water all day and the boat was a jet ski. That was my cultural experience. Let's go to the island for the day. We did. Eight hours standing in the water next to the mangroves, out by jet ski, back by jet ski. Don't worry, the beer came out on a cooler. No problem. It was quite the day. I never quite forgave my husband for that one. So, but if we're talking about activities, we don't want to show them the pictures they're familiar with. We want to show them both. Because the important thing is not that this experience is one of money and this experience is one of poverty, which could cause them to think everybody in other parts of the world can't afford swimming pools. It's what do these kids have in common? They're having fun. They like to swim. So similarities come out of our images. Let's just do a couple more that Donna put together for a presentation we did in Actel. Buying bread. Buying bread in, in my mind as an American used to look like this. It is thankfully changing, and we can get good bread now. But there was a point in my life where I never thought of buying bread looking like this. So when you're teaching culture and you want to teach the word bread, you need the cultural images of bread, the places where they buy it. Or this one, getting water. I'm thirsty. I want a drink. In my mind, it's easy. But for a lot of people in the world, it's not as easy. It's a big deal to get water. Not to frighten you, but they say the next wars will all be over water. Are you ready to go to the beach for the day? Think about it. Are you, somebody sent me this picture. Are you ready to go to the beach for the day? Which picture you want to talk about? The one your mind put in context, in your context, or the one that's actually in the context of the culture? So it's, it's a way of teaching about culture. We can't maybe know all the words. We can't really voice. But just like we started our babies with picture books, we can start our novices with quality images to bring the culture to life. Now, how would you use that picture? I put that slide in here. Those of you that are overachievers, you can go back and read that in detail. But basically, when you have a good image, let them brainstorm the words they already know. Do it individually. Pair. Compare lists. Add more words. Call them out for the teacher. Create a master list. I'll write them. Why will I write them? Hopefully, I won't spell them wrong. Notice the hopefully. Because we make mistakes, too. Then get them to use the words. And you know what's going to happen? They're going to ask you for the words they don't know. Rather than you deciding, here's the vocabulary I need to teach so we can talk about this image. So it, make, it puts them in charge. OK, turn and talk. One idea you've gotten you can use next week if you're in the classroom. One idea you want to share with a program. You get only get two minutes. Process. What's an idea you have so far? OK. A little bit more, a few more ideas. The reason I had you turn and talk is that's the one idea you might remember tomorrow. What we know about the curve of forgetting is really sad. It really strikes fear into our hearts. So we have the opportunity when we look at images to do our three Ps, to really think about what is this product? 
What does it say about a practice? What does it say about a perspective? And we know it's really hard to get at the perspective, even if you're a native speaker, because you only have the perspective of your culture from where you lived and when you lived there. And so a really wise French teacher from Brittany in France once said to myself and the other French teachers in my district, she said, would you stop asking me what the French think? That's what she said. She just put her hands down and said, stop it. She'd been in the United States for 20 years, which she reminded us. She was from a region of France known as Brittany. If you live in Brittany, you do not think of yourself as French. And the French do not think of Brittany as France, because that was all that history of war. And she said, my French is 20 years old. It's for one part of France. So I cannot say all French people. Those of you that have been here for a while, try to complete the sentence. All Americans <laughs> are different. So, and, but sometimes we generalize our culture, and we have to avoid that because we're the bearer of culture. If we say a generalization, they accept it as fact. And so it's wrong to say that all French people use accents and that they're important. Because if you're under 20, you don't believe that anymore. And that means things change. So we want to look at culture. We want to teach them to be observers of culture. So if you look at this image of the US, and you've just arrived, what things, just call them out, because we don't have time to turn and talk, but what things pop into your brain? We drive, we, drive. We, we drive through, we love our coffee, we're willing to pay a fortune for it. Chains are everywhere. We don't, chains, chain restaurants. Starbucks is a chain. We don't have time to go in and talk. And all of a sudden, we're a modern, cult. we're modern, everything's new. You have these ideas based on this picture. There's truth in all of them, but not completely. But if as a French teacher, I say, well, you know, but Starbucks in the US, but French cafes, I am going to stereotype because I also took this picture in France. So it's really important that we allow our students to become observers of culture, that we don't become those who impart culture. Because really, we're more the same than we are different now. Really, we are a global culture more and more, whether we like it or not. So cultural perspectives come through. And what's important is that they help us to base our information on fact rather than stereotype. And so we, as bearers of language, have to be really good stewards of culture. And images can help us do this. I wish I had thought of this as a career, running around the world taking pictures of the same thing in different countries and publishing books. That would have been a good career. But now we have all these series, Rooms of the House. So you go in and you get to see the bedrooms of kids around the world. Compare it to their bedroom. There are similarities and differences. Don't just show poverty. Classrooms of the world. School classrooms around the world, it's much more interesting than talking about yours. Meals. School lunches just blows them away. Because you can ask them which country would they like to have lunch in, and I can pretty much guarantee you they will not say the United States after you do a few of these. Or even pictures of families from around the world. What do they look like? I've been on a mission to tell Spanish teachers, stop saying that there are more multi-generational families in Spanish-speaking countries than in the US, because the latest statistics in the US have us above Mexico for multi-generational families. Why? Anybody have adult children living with them? Because we've had to come home. The economy changed how we think. And so has our population changed how we think. Our images give us opportunities for culture. May I see a show of hands for those of you that would like to venture a guess? In France, is this breakfast? Raise your hand if you believe this is breakfast. Raise your hand if you believe this is lunch. Raise your hand if you believe that this picture is just totally insane. 
so just the prediction, why is it breakfast? Why is it lunch? It's neither. It's me traveling with my husband who says, coffee and a croissant for breakfast is not enough. You have to have protein, so you order the croque monsieur also. And guess what? They serve it because he's the customer. They don't say, that's for lunch. So it's changing how we perceive. Or talking about a park. We get a picture of their park because otherwise I just went to playground, play sets, running on the grass and playing soccer. Not in France. So images bring in this cultural piece. They also allow us to tell stories. We know that stories are important, but I always like to add that it has to be stories that connect, that are based on something of substance that's appealing to the level of the child. So silly stories work really well if you're in elementary, but by the time you're in high school, the fiction you're reading has merit behind it, usually. Not always, usually, no abstracts. So you can take your pictures and build stories out of them. Instead of creating stories around clip art and you have real pictures that can become stories about eating this fish in Puerto Rico or seeing these dancers or getting to go to the beach in December and no one would be there. Do you know why there was nobody on the beach in Puerto Rico in December? It was 80 and too cold. Seriously, it was too cold. They sold wool items in their stores for the people that lived in the mountains or the creatures you saw and how you felt and how you negotiated that these things would not come into your house and how I would say to the geckos, you can have that room but leave the kitchen alone and it didn't work. So every picture you take has a story behind it. So use those for stories. Legends, I picked this one up for Chinese. Are there Chinese speakers that identify with this immediately? Would anybody mind telling us the story real quickly? There's a story, a folk tale around this image, based on what I read anyway. How do I know? Go ahead, if you don't mind. That's exactly what it is. So it's, it's literal. If you like tea, drink it. But behind that message is the figure out what you love to do in life and do it as much as you can. It's that enjoy life doing what you want to do. Avoid the things you don't want to do. So you have these stories in all your languages and all your cultures. These are the ways you can activate them through images. Here's one in Puerto Rico that really invites interesting analysis, I think. We can describe the animal, we can describe the person, and then maybe you'll figure it out if you happen to have some awareness of this legend, but this is the chupacabra, the goat-sucking vampire that lives in Puerto Rico, but recently there was a picture of one in Texas too. So maybe it's like the Zika virus and it's coming here, I don't know. But stories, does anybody remember those kids in the opening one? Here's a YouTube video. You can go in, clip your pictures out, build the story before you show the video. Don't give it all away. Be soap opera teachers. Cliffhang them. But do you know what these children are doing? Has anybody heard of the hole in the wall? Hole in the wall was a, an experiment where they put a computer in a wall and did nothing else. And then they tracked how long it took children in different parts of the world with an English interface that they didn't speak to figure out how to get on the internet and start doing sophisticated things. Within eight hours, most children were on the internet and accessing information and calling their friends over and showing them how to do it. It's fascinating, it's a TED talk, you can watch it, it's just amazing. It, what it is, it says we're not really needed. If we can just activate their desire to learn and get out of the way, young children will do it if they're interested on their own. Okay, turn and talk. One more idea to share, and then I'm going to wrap up with the last segment. Okay, I hate to cut off good discussion, but I also want to give you a, just a few more ideas, and it's a short session. So earlier, I said something about the forgetting curve, and 
yesterday I was talking about some of the research we have on learning vocabulary, and they kind of go together in a way that we need to be mindful of. We know that it takes, on average, 20 times of using a word in context to learn it. So in context means that repeat after me, copy the word five times, fill in the blanks. None of that counts. It has to be activation of the word. So you really want them to use it in context. Well, we're, we're blessed by the fact that we have the three modes of communication. So when we find an image or an article that goes with that image, we want to activate that image in the interpretive mode. Let's talk about what you see. Let's read text that might go with that image. But then we found such a compelling image. Think back to the Japanese one. Remember those two kids that were being held up? There's a story behind that. We can talk about it. We can write about it. Anybody curious about those Japanese kids? Anybody have a young child that age that cries at night? Because if you do, you'll appreciate this story. It's a Shinto religious ceremony. And the Shinto hold the baby up. Of course, a baby that's held like this for a while is going to start screaming. But if the baby screams loudly, that's a sign of good health. So the next time your child is screaming in the middle of the night, think like a Shinto and know that your baby is in good health. Try to stay and celebrate that. Why not use those dads for your family unit? That's a great picture for family, describing them. Then we can talk about their family, and then we can get a picture and write about their family. We want to activate in all three modes. And the reason we want to do this is why I've tried to have you turn and talk at least a couple of times. If all I did was stand up here and talk to you for an hour, the frightening thing is we know that in 48 hours you will remember 20% of what you heard. So the next time you hear yourself speaking as a teacher and talking to your students or lecturing, if some of you also teach at the university level, I want you to step back and say, I worked pretty hard for 20% retention. The only way it gets better, the only way it gets better is if we get application. And that's why Star Talk is really talking about gradual release of responsibility, learner-centered, what is your learning target, how will you check it? Because what we're trying to activate is this notion that until you can do something with it, you can't retain it. So you have to hold it before you walk out the doors. So my hope is the things you talked about, you'll hold. You'll remember them. Everything else will be gone. So this picture went viral. How many of you have seen it before? Viral images and videos are a teacher's best friend. So if you are not subscribed to anything because you just detest all social media, at least find some source that posts viral videos. Because if everybody's talking about it, it's a perfect tool for you. Who lives in New Jersey? I have a great viral video of five bears, a bear family in the backyard, messing up a swimming pool. For a teaching family, there's nothing better. What are they doing? Are they behaving? Are they misbehaving? How many are there? Are they big? Are they friendly? No sound, because it was in English. Just turn it off. These things are worth talking about, because everybody is. So obviously you get some, you can talk about it. Remember those three questions. What more can you say? What evidence do you have? What do you see? And we'll do that and we'll build vocabulary. So in the interpretive mode now, I've got a text to read. I didn't pass out the picture and the article at the same time. Because if I do, I'm forgetting to treat them with, like picture book kids at the novice level. Get them interested in the picture so they want to read the book. That's what we have to do. We have to get them interested in the image so they want to read. So those of you that don't speak French, Danielle's nine years old, he lives in the Philippines. There in itself is a great geography lesson because as we know, many Americans do not know where the Philippines are. 
It's a country in Southeast Asia that should help many people, but not all middle schoolers will be helped by that, or adults for that matter. It is, I get to do 11,000, a nice big number in context rather than counting my numbers in order. Because I don't know about you, but no one in France has ever asked me to count to 100 by 10. Or to 20, for that matter. So we're putting our numbers in context. The Philippines are more than 7,000 miles, or have more than 7,000 islands. He lives in Cebu, et cetera, et cetera. What's one thing a novice could do? If it's a language where they can write, then that works. If it's not a language where they can write, they might turn and talk. So you're going to say, write two questions, or think of one question that is answered in the article. That's low level. Evidence, it's right there. What are you practicing? The most important thing, asking questions. In order to get to intermediate low, I said it earlier, you gotta ask questions. So who can think of a question? Call out a couple. How old is Danielle? Where does Danielle live? Where are the Philippines? Wasn't that all of your get acquainted language? In a different context about a real person? Now, if I said to look at textual evidence in the picture, what are some questions you could write? It's not answered in the article. I briefly translated it to you. What is he doing? Why is he outside on the street? Is it morning or night? Where are his parents? He's only nine years out. He's out on the street at night. Why? So you're thinking, why, 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 why? I cut off this picture. If I had cut the whole thing, guess what's up here in the corner? A McDonald's. So cultural comparisons. Oh, he's outside studying under the lamp of a street light, but there's a McDonald's on that corner too? Hmm, this is different. This is very different. So then we can turn and talk. So if you're still writing worksheets to go with your readings, don't. Let them write the questions and then come up with the answers. Make them work harder. So interpretive mode, presentational mode. We have to teach writing. If you have a middle schooler or a high school student or college student maybe, they don't know how to write a paragraph in first language. This is a shock. But if you go to a freshman English teacher teaching English to American-born ch children and ask them if the children in her class, the students in her class, know how to write a paragraph, the answer will be no, and she is not upset. Because it's very hard to teach children to write a true paragraph, opening sentence, closing sentence, connecting sentences. So I used to give homework that said write five sentences. And what I would get was garbage. Has anybody had that experience? So they would turn in things like, Danielle is young, he is a student, he likes school, he studies, he studies at night. That's what they would turn in. They met the goal, five sentences. Instead, if I'm working on presentational mode, why don't I write the garbage and challenge them to pair and write a good sentence? So if I give them the garbage, then we can work on presentational mode from this picture by writing a fairly simple sentence using transition words. Danielle is a young student who studies at night because he likes school. All five ideas are in one sentence. And now I'm working on fluency, improving my writing, getting those sentences to move from memorized to the simple to the compound. So we want to maximize. The other thing I'm doing, I'm using these words in context so that they're learning them. Interpersonal, a little harder, because we got to do a lot of role playing. We got to pretend a lot in order to get this role play going. Well, one of you pretend to be Danielle. You know some basic facts about him. And one of you just pretend to be you or this kid studying and make up your answers. Because I can't always say, hi, what is your name? Where do you live? Because I know her and we both live in Chicago. And how old are you? If we're all in middle school, well, she might be 13 and I'm 12, but there's just not much interest in asking questions where the answers are known. So just one short little article, one paragraph, became the opportunity to learn about a child living in another culture 
certain vocabulary associated with that image activated through the three modes of communication, which is actually a mini IPA, so that when you get ready to do that summative assessment, you're practicing that mini IPA to lead to the summative assessment in your units. So, anybody not convinced that images will work? How many of you have seen this video? This is your parting thought. Anybody have a question while I start it? Anybody seen this video? It'll make you happy and sad. There's music, but I don't think you really need it. At your tables, whether you react to it positively or negatively, because it impacts different people different ways, just remember you're not restricted to movies that address your culture. We are universal. We talk about global. So everything is open to you. But take two minutes at your table and talk about how could I use this video. And I would suggest you think about pieces of it over a long time rather than showing the whole video. What could I do for the interpretive, the presentational, the interpersonal? What's something that would work in my situation for my age of learner? Two minutes, because I only have three left. Okay, in the interest of ending in time, on time, is anyone in here from Michigan? Lest you were thinking about this as a civilized nation versus a third world country, what about Flint, Michigan? So it isn't that we're trying to say us and them. It's here is a problem. Now let's look at it, how it impacts our lives. Anybody in here from California? You guys got pretty concerned about water lately. So I mean, these are issues that our children, our students are going to face, and we hope they can solve them. So I'll leave you with a quote. Meaning is communicated through image more readily than print. Think about that. Meaning is communicated more readily than print. And for those of you that have script language, Chinese, with your characters, you don't start with characters when they're three years old. You got to get them into the language through the picture books, making visual literacy a really powerful teaching tool. So I thank you very much. And I will post this also on my wiki. If anybody just feels like they have to have the PowerPoint, you can run up and grab it if you have a flash drive. But it will also go on the um, Star Talk site. So thank you for coming. I hope you enjoy one more session and then birthday cake. Right? And, he, and I'm here to, I, we can ask questions for a few minutes. We have a 15 minute break. So thank you. Go forth, look at images in a new way.